There are over 17,500 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you behind the scenes at America's top museums. We're in Bronx, New York at the New York Botanical Garden. A living museum of plants, this 250-acre National Historical Landmark was founded in 1891 and is the largest botanical garden in the United States. Not only is it home to over one million plants in its 50 gardens, but it's also an educational institution and a world leader in plant research and conservation. The stunning Haupt Conservatory is America's largest Victorian-style glass house, offering an eco-tour of the world. A short walk away is the Mertz Library, the largest botanical and horticultural library in the world. There's a very special exhibition on view right now by world-renowned glass artist Dale Chihuly. His signature bold and colorful sculptures have been carefully placed throughout the New York Botanical Garden, making it a living canvas. We'll learn more about the special relationship between the artist and the New York Botanical Garden and learn about his creative process. We'll also get a behind the scenes peek at the Herculean task of placing these massive yet delicate glass sculptures throughout the gardens, fountains, and conservatory. So let's begin by emerging ourselves in the ever-changing world of Mother Nature here at the New York Botanical Garden. So thank you so much, Todd, for letting us come and visit the New York Botanical Garden today. What a spectacular day. Yeah, we're lucky. It's a beautiful July morning. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah, a little warm. But a little warm. <laughs> let's talk about the garden and the history of the garden. OK, the garden um, was established by an act of the state legislature of New York in 1891. It was founded by a man named Nathaniel Lord Britton and his wife, Elizabeth Knight Britton. They were scientists. They were botanists. Um, and they had gone to England on their honeymoon and they had visited a place called the Royal Botanic Garden Kew. And it was a glorious institution that was devoted to a three-part mission of botanical science, education, and horticulture, or the growing of plants. They came back to New York and they said, New York and America need an institution like this. So they, they dedicated themselves to getting one created. They were successful in 1891, um, New York State, um, agreed to support the creation of this institution, and New York City agreed to allow 250 acres here in the Bronx to be the garden's home. We go off and running from that moment, and we've been pursuing this three-part mission of botanical science, education, and horticulture ever since, for more than 125 years. And what was the, was the original building, what's standing behind us? Yeah, now, so that's or? the Enid A. Hopkins Conservatory, and that was completed in 1902, ground was broken in 1899, so in order to be a museum of plants, we needed to be able to grow the broadest range of plants possible. So a conservatory, a hothouse, a glass house yeah, was essential. So yeah, you could grow yeah. palm trees and orchids and tropical ferns and cycads and all the things that our scientists would study and that students would come and learn about. And really the garden is first and foremost an educational institution. Um, and we educate everyone from preschoolers through PhDs. We have about 100,000 New York City school children who come visit the garden every year. Some for formal programs, their teachers come during the summer and they learn how to use the garden to teach science through plants. Others through drop-in programs, they just come to visit this beautiful place in spring or fall. And we serve those students by teaching them science, but also by connecting them to the beauty and complexity and diversity of nature. And in some ways, um, the garden since day one, since 1891, has been about that. It's about connecting people to the incredible fragility and beauty and complexity of the natural world around us. In fact, 
This site was chosen, actually in 1895, a few years down the road, because at its heart is a 50-acre old-growth forest. It had never been cut. It was called in the 19th century the most beautiful natural area in New York City. And you can imagine 125 years later how much more important and essential it is. Sure. And we as an institution have been preserving it since then. And what are the researchers and the scientists doing that are in the outbuildings here? Yeah, so most people, we get 1.1 million visitors to the garden, and many of those visitors are unaware that actually the largest part of the garden in terms of staff is our science program. And we have always had a core group of scientists, there are about 40 PhDs on staff now doing their work, and they study the plants of the world with the goal of saving the plants of the world. So we have scientists who study plant evolution, we have scientists who study plant biodiversity in the Amazon basin. We have scientists who study the use of plants for medicine in the South Pacific. We have now scientists who study genomics, how genes make certain things happen in plants, and molecular systematics, how genes show us how plants are related and how plants have evolved over time. And that happens in our herbarium, uh, the Steer Herbarium, which is the second largest herbarium in the world, nearly 8 million dried pressed plant specimens. It happens in our uh, genomics lab, the Pfizer lab, where we study, again, we have in a typical laboratory, people in white coats and glasses and oh, really? beakers, science. science. Um, <laughs> and again, most of our visitors have, have no idea that this is going on around them. Um, but what's interesting is just by visiting the garden, you're supporting this work. And by coming to see our Chihuly exhibition or the beautiful perennial garden around us, you're actually helping save the plants of the world by supporting the work our scientists do. I know, I mean, standing in this perennial garden, it's, it's breathtaking. I've decided I'm going to take a picture of it and show my own garden and see if it will strive towards We it. often say, don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah, don't try it at home, is right. But I know, besides the programs that, you, that the scientists are working on, I know there's jazz at night. And tell me about some of the other programs that are here for children and adults and families. Yeah, so, so for people like you and me who love plants and love nature, we don't really need anything to compel us to come to the beautiful New York Botanical Garden 12 months a year. But some people, New Yorkers, might not have that same connection to nature. So what we've done is we've created a program of changing exhibitions. We'll learn about the Chihuly exhibition in a little bit. Um, but we also have wonderful uh, performing arts programs. We have concerts. We have demonstrations, glass blowing demonstrations, really lots of ways to make a visit to the garden a full, rich day. Always the goal is to better connect our visitors to the beauty, complexity, and diversity, and fragility of the world of plants. What kind of conservation projects are, are going on here? So the really amazing thing is that you'd think in New York City, um, and even in North America, which has been you know, developed for so long, there isn't a need for plant conservation. But we are actively working to conserve plants in New York City, in our own Thane family forest, the 50-acre old growth forest, even in Central Park. Um, what we're learning is that plants are resilient, and they've been able to survive uh, sort of development for centuries, um, but they need our help now more than ever. We do that here. We do that in the Atlantic coastal forests of Brazil. Um, we do it in the South Pacific. We do it in Vietnam and throughout Southeast Asia. Our scientists, uh, they, they partner with local NGOs and conservation organizations to identify which parts of the world need the most protection, which parts of the world are most at risk from development or from climate change. And together, our botanists and conservationists are creating strategies and plans to save the plants of the world. Well, I for one want to thank you for that. And I know that we're going to head over and see some of the Chihuly pieces now, so let's go. Okay, great. Thanks. So we're standing in front of this gorgeous Dale Chihuly. Tell me about this artist. So this is the Sol de Citron, which is one of 22 installations by the great artist Dale Chihuly and part of our program, a regular program of seasonal exhibitions where we explore the connections of plants, nature, and art in the humanities. The New York Botanical Garden has, is dedicated, as we've learned, to connecting people to the natural world. And we've learned through our more than 125 years that one way to get people to care about nature mm -hmm. is to show them how it connects to the rest of their lives. 
So through this exhibition program at the garden, including the Chihuly sculptures, um, we've done that. And it draws diverse audiences from all over the world, really, to come. And they come maybe to see Dale's work, but they leave having fallen in love with the garden. Well, and his work in particular seems ageless. I've seen children here that are dying to touch them and, and overwhelmed by the color, but um, adults too. We all can identify with them. Yeah, there's something extremely accessible about Dale's work, and I compare it to a Japanese flowering cherry in full flower in spring. You don't have to explain to anyone why that's beautiful. You don't have to explain to anyone why Dale's work is beautiful and why it draws people in, why, why it serves to attract, again, an incredibly diverse sort of population of people who just find it fantastic. And what they love to see about it here at the garden is these amazing glass sculptures aligned in our historic landscape, around our mature trees, and within the historic Enid A. Hout Conservatory. It's the perfect setting really for any art, but for, particularly for Dale's art. Dale Chihuly was born in 1941 in Tacoma, Washington. He enrolled in the first glass program in the country at the University of Wisconsin and continued his studies at the Rhode Island School of Design, where he later established the glass program and taught for more than a decade. In 1968, after receiving a Fulbright Fellowship, he went to work at the Vanini Glass Factory in Venice. There he learned the team approach to blowing glass, which is critical to the way he works today. In 1971, Chihuly co-founded Pilchuck Glass School in Washington State. With this international glass center, Chihuly has led the avant-garde in development of glass as fine art. These early works show that Chihuly has continually experimented with scale, color, and composition throughout his career. Tell me, how did that relationship start? He, he's exhibited here before? He, yeah, we worked with Dale first in 2006, and he, at that stage of his career, um, was looking for ways to connect his art to a broader audience. And he had the brilliant idea, because his work is all done in glass, of course, that glass conservatories, buildings devoted to growing plants, would be a great place to show his work because of those parallels between the glass of his work and the glass of the buildings. And of course, the Enid A. Hout Conservatory here at NYBG is one of the great conservatories of the world. So he came to us and said, I would love to show my work here. And we said, great, bring it on. So in 2006, uh, you know, we had our first really major sculpture exhibition. It was spread throughout the garden and it was transformative in terms of our audience. Uh, we had people who had never been to the garden before, who had grown up in New York City, been there their whole lives, wow. who had never been to the garden before. And they came rushing out and they came again and again and again. It was during that exhibition in 2006 that we learned that nighttime events at the garden uh, can be very, very, very popular. And of course we have nighttime events this year for our Chihuly exhibition as well. and the lighting on these is gorgeous. They, they glow, don't they? They're almost luminous. It's a completely different experience at night as it is than it is during the day. It really is, and that's the great thing. And also, um, you know, with our special exhibitions, they run over many times three seasons, in this case, spring, summer, and fall. So if one came to see Chihuly in April, when you come again in July, it's a different show, and again in October, it's a different show again. 
So that's the wonderful thing about combining kind of art and humanities with nature and gardening is that you learn about the in some ways the art of nature, the sort of inspiring complexity and beauty and subtlety, um, and in some cases not so subtlety, of the nature around you. Now, I have to ask you a question being an artist. I, thinking about the logistics of this type of show, I know some of the pieces were made specifically for this site, but how do you install something like this? It doesn't come all together, does it? So we worked with Dale and his team starting about three years ago, came on a site visit, and of course he had been here before in 2006, but the gardens change a lot. Gardens change every day. Sure. They change every season, they change every year, and we've been working really hard to make the garden kind of more interesting and more compelling and more beautiful. And so we've added gardens, we've added an azalea garden, and a native plant garden, and we've been become more sophisticated about the way we combine art and the garden. Mm -hmm. So when he came a few years ago, he was blown away. It was like he was coming to a different place. So that's the process starts, and um, this is his canvas, isn't it? Yeah, it really exactly. Becomes, well, that's yeah. a very good point. Yeah. I think I, we, I think of sort of the garden as his canvas. I think of the individual pieces of glass that make up these sculptures as kind of the drips of paint. Sure. Um, and then like they're the combined strokes, exactly. They're right, combined yeah. in new ways, and the whole kind of the whole tableau, the whole combination is what makes the installation. It's not just Dale's work. It's not just the garden, but it's the combination of those things together. Absolutely. Amazing. I mean, and this this is stunning. Yeah, this is, again, Sol Soda Citron. Um, there are about 1,248, if I remember correctly, over 1,200 pieces of glass um, assembled to make that amazing installation. And it took a team of four people about four days to put it together. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it's a remarkable kind of, it's great to watch. Uh, the Chihuly team includes a lot of artists. Um, it's Dale's vision, um, and they're here to implement Dale's vision. Yeah. And what's great is that they're also, they're falling in love with the garden as they're installing these pieces sure. in the garden. And it's sort of a great experience from day one where you're just sort of assembling all the glass on the ground to the finish of the installation where everything feels kind of perfect and like it's always been here. Well, and then for you to have the opportunity to see everybody enjoying it. Yeah, and, I mean, it's, and, and, it's really something. And you open the gates and people flood in, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and again, um, for each exhibition that we've done, we did a wonderful exhibition about Frida Kahlo a few years ago, and that brought in, again, an audience that we really hadn't seen at the garden before. We did an exhibition about Charles Darwin, about Emily Dickinson, in each of these exhibitions, which makes a very strong connection to the garden's mission as a, as a museum of plants, um, introduces our mission to a new audience of people whose first passion might be poetry or whose first passion might be architectural history. Sure. Um, and again, they see something that they love in this setting and it expands the palette of what they love. Yeah, and it speaks to them in that sense. Absolutely. Now tell me what's going on at the Mertz Library. I understand we can understand a little bit more about the process of this art. Yeah, so the, the, most people know Dale's monumental work, his giant towers and chandeliers. This exhibition was created to be in many ways a retrospective of his very long career as an artist mm -hmm. and also to introduce our visitors to elements of his oeuvre that they might not have seen before, including a lot of very small, very delicate, very beautiful pieces that are on display in our library art gallery. That's completely different than 2006. In 2006, everything was either in the conservatory or out across the garden's landscape. So a visit to the garden for this exhibition gives people a much broader sense of Dale as an artist. All right, good, good, beautiful. sand and fire and put it together and you have glass and you make it turns into a liquid imagine the sand turns into a liquid and then you stick a pipe in there and gather it up like honey and bring it out and blow down there and you blow a shape that over the centuries glass blowers have learned to make it into an incredible array of forms and I've been lucky enough to come along at the right time, at the right place, Whoa. Uh, to be able to expand Lovely. many of the forms that Maybe were made hold it up throughout this 2000 year history. I was using just human breath going down into this miraculous material, blowing it up, pushing its limits, making it as thin as I could, and getting it so hot that it would almost collapse and begin to move. So I'm, I was pushing the edge of thinness and collapsibility 
and making new forms. You know, the baskets did evolve into the sea forms and the sea forms evolved into the Persians. But you know, a series like the Venetians will come in, which are totally different. You know, or the chandeliers, which came out of nowhere. It requires a, a totally a different type of thinking. I mean, we're not talking about objects here. We're talking about 12 or 1400 pieces of glass making one object. And really, what I've always been interested in is space. Even when I made the cylinders, the single object cylinder, or the machias, my, my interest was always in space. So I was thinking not of the object itself, but how the object would look in a room. The chandeliers don't really relate to that evolution of the basket sea forms Persians, probably. So, you know, as an artist, I, I just make, I just work, I just, things just come out. So it's, it's not that you're constantly searching for something new, it's just that something new comes. This is important. Make them as big as we can. The bigger, the better. I don't know why I work so large. I very often push a series to its maximum size. I, I think sometimes I do it just to keep the glass blowers uh, at the very edge of their technical ability, to keep the tension high, to make it exciting, Fabulous. to make it so that we don't know whether it's gonna break or not break. If you know exactly what you're doing and you can make it every time, it's not gonna be interesting. It has to have this tension if the pieces are gonna be good. And so we constantly push ourselves, you know. I push them, they push me. Uh, I try to get them to go beyond what they can do. Um, it's more interesting that way. Wow, what a treat to see an open-air museum of plants in its summer glory. And seeing Dale Chihuly's work in a botanical setting was an extra treat. I hope you can fit a trip to the New York Botanical Garden into your schedule any time of year. Come to explore Mother Nature and recharge your soul. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time. <laughs>